Doctor, my child's legs look funny. Concerned parents often consult primary care doctors about deformities of their child's legs. These apparent deformities are usually a variation of normal growth. They range from physiological, which resolve with growth time, to pathological, which may need aggressive treatment. Limb deformities can be congenital or acquired. As future primary care doctors, it is essential that fifth year medical students have an approach to these deformities. Here is a crash course on the following limb deformities in children. Angular deformities, rotational deformities. A careful history and physical examination is necessary to determine whether the complaint requires further evaluation. On history, be sure to elicit the following. Do a general examination followed by a systemic examination of the nervous system and musculoskeletal system. Let's begin. Angular deformities. Genu valgum. This is when there is an angular deformity at the knee where the apex of the deformity points towards the midline. Genu varum. This is an angular deformity at the knee where the apex of the deformity points away from the midline. Both are very common and can be a variation of normal physiological development or it can be pathological. Pathological causes of genu valgum include rickets, skeletal dysplasia and trauma. Pathological causes of genu varum include Blount's disease, rickets, skeletal dysplasia and trauma. To differentiate between the two, one has to understand the normal physiological development of the lower limb. In normal development, from 0 to 2 years there is genu varum. At 2 and a half years, the limbs are straight. From 3 to 7 years there is genu valgum and the limbs should be straight by 8. The limbs are straight when the hip joint, knee joint and ankle joint are in alignment. Take a thorough history and examination. Check for laxity of the medial and lateral collateral ligaments of the knee, which is supportive of a pathological condition. Check for flat feet and external tibial torsion, which may accentuate the appearance of genu valgum. It is important to assess the progression of the deformity. Measure intermalleolar distance to assess progression of genu valgum, and measure intercondylar distance to assess progression of genu varum. These measurements should be done at regular intervals. If the measurements increase with time, the deformity may be worsening. Management Reassure the parent and reassess the child at regular intervals with serial measurements of intercondylar or intermalleolar distance. Refer the patient if there are features of pathology, such as progression of the deformity, genu varum after the age of 3, genu valgum after the age of 7, asymmetry or history of trauma. Rotational deformities In towing is when the feet or toes point towards the midline during gait. It may originate in the foot as metatarsus adductus, in the lower limb as internal tibial torsion or in the hip as internal femoral antiversion. Out towing is when the feet or toes point away from the midline during gait. It may be due to external tibial torsion or external rotation of the hip. Both in towing and out towing are common and tend to resolve spontaneously. Rotational deformities have a wide range of normal and often related to ligamentous laxity. Tests are done to elicit the origin of the deformity. Is it in the foot, tibia or femur? Observe the patient's gait. Look for a limp and alignment of the foot and patella. When assessing the foot progression angle, ask the patient to walk towards you and look at their feet. A normal foot progression angle ranges from 6 to 10 degrees of external rotation and varies with age. An internal foot progression angle describes a foot that points towards the midline. An external foot progression angle describes a foot that points away from the midline. Can you assess the foot progression angle in this boy?
He has an internal foot progression angle as his feet point towards the midline. In metatarsus adductus, the forefoot is adducted at the tarsometatarsal joint. It may be caused by intrauterine molding and may be perpetuated by sleeping prone. Assessment On examination of the foot, the sole has a convex lateral border and a concave medial side which is passively correctable. The hind foot is normal or in slight valgus. Measure the heel bisector line. Flex the knee to 90 degrees and dorsiflex the ankle so that the plantar surface is parallel to the ceiling. Approximate a visual line parallel to the heel and extend distally to the toes. A normal heel bisector line goes through the second toe. Metatarsus adductus is diagnosed when the heel bisector line is lateral to the second toe. Flexibility of metatarsus adductus should also be assessed by applying lateral force to the great toe and attempting to reduce the heel bisector line back to the second toe. Management if flexible, 90% resolves spontaneously by 3 years old. Referral is warranted if the deformity persists at 3 years old, if there is stiffness, asymmetry, pain or calluses. Tibial torsion In tibial torsion, the tibia usually internally rotates, producing intoing. The exact etiology is unknown, but it may be due to intrauterine positioning or excessive tightness of the medial ligamentous structures of the leg. Assessment. It is commonly noticed when the child begins walking and parents report that the child's legs are turning in or they have new onset clumsiness and often trip. On examination, there is an internal foot progression angle and a neutral or external patella progression angle. The medial malleolus is level with or posterior to the lateral malleolus. The thigh foot angle is neutral or internal. Assess the thigh foot angle in the prone position. Flex the knee at 90 degrees and dorsiflex the foot so the plantar surface is parallel to the ceiling. Allow the foot to fall into a neutral position. Approximate a visual line along the long axis of the thigh and a second line along the long axis of the heel. The angle formed between these two lines is the thigh foot angle. A normal thigh foot angle varies with age. It is usually 15 to 20 degrees externally rotated. If the line of the heel points towards the midline relative to the thigh, it suggests internal tibial torsion. If it points away, it suggests external tibial torsion. Femoral version. Femoral version is the angular difference between the longitudinal axis of the femoral neck and the transcondylar axis of the femur in the horizontal plane. Increased femoral antiversion is associated with increased internal rotation and decreased external rotation of the hip. Increased femoral antiversion is the result of intrauterine molding and genetic inheritance. There is a wide variation of normal. Assessment On examination, the patella face medially when standing. During gait, there is an internal foot progression angle and an internal patella progression angle. There is an egg beater pattern during running and preference for sitting in the W position. Testing hip rotation. This is done with the patient lying prone. Stabilize the pelvis and then flex the knees to 90 degrees. Hold the leg and gently internally rotate. And then externally rotate the hip. The amount of internal rotation needed to make the greater trochanter maximally prominent is the degree of antiversion. The average amount of internal hip rotation during childhood is between 40 and 50 degrees and external hip rotation is between 40 and 70 degrees. With increased femoral antiversion, there is increased internal rotation and decreased external rotation at the hip. Management both tibial and femoral torsion usually resolve spontaneously. Refer if there is persistence at the age of 8, the patient is symptomatic, there is asymmetry, limp or associated deformities. Thanks for watching!